okay, let's give this a shot and see how easy it is. Uh, you need the sequel. Usually you can use the most recent one, so we'll try it. It's called Local DB, or sometimes it says Local, it says uh, Sequel 2016 Express Edition. Click on that. I usually go to one of the first uh, uh, selections on the search, and I can typically get to a page like this. You look up here, and you can see that I'm on the most recent version, but you can look up older versions as well if you want. I've already run this on SQL Server 2014, so I know it runs pretty stable uh, using that and the defaults that are in the uh, program to run this little server. But in this case, I'm just going to go to my downloads. And you can get a developer edition, which is basically the local DB setup, uh, but that's uh, uh, not as easy as using the Express Edition. It's the free edition, works great. Save a little uh, icon to your desktop, double click on it and extract it. I've actually already extracted it. And it looks like this. You can decide where you want to locate it. And I go into the setup and double click on that. And SQL Server 2016 has just come out. It's a lot more similar to the full version of SQL Server than it used to be. And it seems quite good so far. I haven't had any problems with it yet. And uh, I hope you'll be able to use it in the servers that we've been building. Do a little rule check. You go through the wizard. It's pretty standard setup. Uh, SQL Server can be pretty complex, but SQL Server Express is actually a little bit easier. Um, we'll perform a new installation of SQL Server uh, 2016, which again will be the Express Edition. Now, notice that I can put in some of these uh, extra services, and that's fine. You may want to use the Express Edition of SQL Server to run, say, Visual Studio applications that you're building, but in this case, I don't need it. So I'm going to click off all those tools. And I do always like getting the SDK, although I already have it, so I'm going to go into the local DB only. That's the one I want. So local DB, you take a look at this. It says is a lightweight version of the SQL Server Express Edition database engine that has the same programmability features yet starts on demand and runs in user mode. Uh, that's a good local way of running a database. And my historian works fine on it or the bigger versions. Uh, I've even got it working in the Azure cloud. Uh, but this local DB option is just for the Windows desktop. It's simple enough. Click next. We go through that. And uh, I may pause the video here and uh, wait until we finish uh, the installation. Come back in a minute. When you're done, it's going to look something like this. And you hope that you have your green go on the side there. The local DB has been successfully installed and a couple of uh, client helpers so that you can visualize and uh, uh, extract data, you know, uh, and use the databases uh, with program. I'll close that. And you can also install the SQL Server management tools, although uh, uh, I use different versions of it, sometimes an older version that I like. Uh, I'm not going to use it today. Today we're going to show the SQL Server data straight from Visual Studio, which you can use a community edition. Um, SQL Server uh, local DB is already uh, connected now. And let's go ahead and I think we can go straight into Visual Studio. Actually, first, I'm going to start the Modbus simulator. Now, what this does is simulate my hardware. So I don't have to have anything fancy hooked up to make it work. Uh, this is just simulating something, uh, you know, whatever you want it to say. Uh, maybe I want uh, to freeze in Fahrenheit, so I would change the temperature setting. And that'll simulate the hardware. We'll leave that running. Go into Visual Studio. Again, you can use the Community Edition, which is free. And uh, this is the way to deal with the uh, programming environment, of course. Uh, they all have an installer that handles all this as, with as much automation as I can get away with. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to open up the project directly from my archives. I use a repository where I do all my writing. In this case, it's uh, the ninth edition. 
I'm going to bring up the project, but we really don't need it to see the visuals. I mean, excuse me, the SQL Server data. We're going to be able to see the SQL Server data from the SQL Server Object Explorer tab. I click on there. I get a number of my SQL servers that are running out in the uh, local space. In this case, there's my local one. Project V13 is its name. So we're going to want to remember that. And it's running on the local DB, which means the local host is serving that database. Uh, very simple, slimmed down version of the full SQL Server. Totally works on a desktop. It's going to work for our program as well. Uh, quick little overview of the program. Uh, you see we're going to use a SQL client. And we're going to use uh, some freeware that helps me deal with the Modbus side. And I do have to use threading now with... Uh, with this program, uh, it was not working without it. And uh, there's actually the freeware right there, and ModServe is my uh, namespace. <clears throat> and then your standard uh, libraries for handling a basic Windows Forms application. Uh, you roll through, the application itself actually uh, has a state of stop or, or go. It's very uh, simplified and straightforward so that I can handle the connections to the hardware. Uh, those connections need to be explicitly stopped and started so I wanted to make this program the gateway that grabs the data back and forth between the two or three systems. I want it to be simple as well, so it's straightforward. Starts a thread, runs a count on that thread, which I basically use or don't use accordingly. Uh, has a start-stop indication so that I can start a loop. And in that loop, I open a Modbus client from the freeware, and I connect to it. And then I start a uh, while loop, which allows me that when I'm connected to the server, which in this case I am because I started the client here. I can then uh, extract my data. In this case, I'm extracting the first 96 holding registers and I am uh, changing uh, several of the values into 32-bit uh, floats, several of the values into 64-bit floats. That's all this conversion jazz down here. And uh, then I grab a date time string and finish up with a SQL call. This is all running at the sample rate that a user will set in the WinForms application. And in that SQL call, I basically pack all the data that I had brought from that one call from the Modbus device, from the hardware device, and I pack all that data into a SQL call and input it as a row in the SQL server, in this case, the local DB on my desktop. That is pretty much the entire program in a nutshell. It uh, is just the server, so it is just serving the data from the Modbus hardware to the SQL server. Let's go ahead and start it. Again, we're running the Modbus simulator, and notice, oh, uh, wanted to show this new thing in Visual Studio 2017. I just got a little bit of a nag. It's making sure that I know what kind of debugging experience I'm going through right now. I want to continue debugging. Again, on the Modbus simulator, I have several values changed in, uh, notice it's in the address, the holding a register address of 40001. That would be this address here. This would be 40002, you know, and onward. Again, Modbus uh, is a one-based array. So that means the array starts at one. The arrays in my programming typically start with a zero as per the .NET standard, so you'll see a little bit of a bump back and forth, but it's easy enough to understand once you understand the offset. And to actually understand full offsetting in Modbus is very important because sometimes you're getting a Modbus map from a device that doesn't start directly at the first address. It may start down in, you know, the 41,000 territory, you know, somewhere further in the map, and you'd want to offset all your data to it. Standard Modbus exercise in the engineering world uh, here's our server, so just to unclutter everything, you can decide your sample rate, and it can be as low as one second. I haven't tried it any lower than that, but I think it does work. Uh, we're going to do some testing on that soon. Uh, here's my IP address. In this case, it's my local host, because I know that I'm running my local DB instance at my local host. 127.0.0.1 is the IP address for the local host on the local computer. That's this computer. I have a port, standard TCP port, which is 502. I'm using the standard one. You can change it if you need to. And then the connection string. I'm leaving in a default connection string because uh, the local DB, for example, when you install 
Microsoft SQL Local DB 2014, this would be the default connection string. Now, what I mean by default is uh, this is the normal name for the instance of the SQL Server. Our SQL Server, if you remember correctly, is Project V13, so I'm pretty sure this needs to change. We're going to give that a shot. And the initial catalog, which is the database name, is called history. Now, we haven't done that yet, so let's go back into Visual Studio. This is how easy this is going to be, is you can build the entire environment with just a few steps, and you follow each of these steps and then just pause the video while you finish the last, or the you know each step in the line. Uh, we've got a local DB here. See, I'm in SQL Server Object Explorer. <clears throat> I go into my local DB and look at my databases, and I actually already have a history database. Let's go ahead and delete that so that I can show you how this is done. I'll delete the backup, yes, and I'll close the existing connections. Okay. I'm going to get a script. In this case, it's called dbo.history.sql. This is something that's always going to be inside the open source areas of my program so that you can quickly build a database. Uh, I'm going to click on databases and say add new databases. Add new database, and we'll add one of them called history. I typically leave the default location. You can move it, but uh, sometimes it gets a little confusing. So now we're going to have a history database. In that history database, I'm going to right click and I'm going to say new query. That query is as simple as grabbing this script. And just a quick look, you'll see that I am dealing with a, a key. That's how databases know the difference between rows. I have a name, and that actually will come up typically null unless you're using naming, because sometimes people connect to these SQL servers, not just from their device hardware, but from other programs. And uh, typically, there's it's a good start to have some sort of descriptive name at the beginning of a table. But in this case, uh, for the basic Modbus server, you'll see null because we're not using that. Timestamp is being generated, uh, but of course I need it in the table. I then have 96 registers of holding registers. I then have the place where I keep the floats because even after I convert them, I actually move them to the database converted. So you'll end up having the raw 16-bit unsigned integers, such as uh, between 43 and 44 which would be the first 32-bit float. And then in register 101, that's where that particular float would be held in each row of the database. So you've got these registers, which can show off analog data, temperature, flow, you know, how fast a fan's going. And you've got some 64-bit ones as well for higher-end usage, such as GPS coordinates or anything else you're using the uh, controller to do. I wanted to make sure there was still a base pack of four or so registers that could be cleanly output to any HMI, touchscreen, you know, Excel file, whatever, and you can see the final value. Because when you're looking at Modbus registers and you're just looking at register 43 and 44, you're definitely not converting that in your head to IEEE 754. So this is our table generating script. We go ahead and take that script and drop it into the new query for this particular history database. I'll execute it from here, click, and that command is successful. So if I go into history, I should be able to go into my tables and I should have a dbo.history table, which was what was created by the script. If I double click on it, I can double check to see that I now have columns for all my uh, fields. So great, the database is ready. That means we can start the server. It's that easy. Uh, I've never done it actually all at the same time, but it should work fine. And uh, we'll start the server with these settings at a sample rate of one second, as fast as I can go. And we'll see if it starts. If it does not connect, then that's because we didn't do our connection string correctly, and we'll have to troubleshoot a little bit. But I believe this is how it'll work. And it does actually look like we're good. So uh, let's go into the database. I'm back in my Visual Studio tool, which is what I use for all my SQL management nowadays. SQL Management Studio is a great separate product. I do like it a lot, uh, yet I'm a Visual Studio developer actually developing the application. So I'm typically wanting to be inside the same space to get the work done. In this case, I just simple as right-clicking on that database that I want to look at and viewing data. And 
I know that's a new database, so there is the new data. 32 in register 1, 132 in register 2. Let's double check that. And there's the data. Coming in every second, let's extend this timestamp column to see if that's true. And there you go. Every second, I'm bringing it in. And uh, it's staying very consistent. I'm liking that a lot. Let's stop there and uh, move to the next challenge.